right. The only problem I had with this message when I preached it in the homes was it was too short. So I want to try to take care of that and see if we can make it a little longer or whatever. But as we share this with you, you might turn to the book of Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 and some familiar verses here. I trust that it will be a, a, a blessing to you. And simply I want to talk to you about the meaning of the empty tomb. And I've had the privilege, and my wife was with me also at the time, of being in Jerusalem and being in the empty tomb. And uh, there was just something about it. I mean, you know, uh, there's something about that place where you realize that Jesus was. And I was so thankful that there wasn't a part of Jesus laying around in there. I know that they have a temple in China, and they have uh, the tiny finger of Buddha, supposedly. And people go there to worship that tiny finger of Buddha. And uh, how different that is when we think in terms of Jesus, because with Jesus, there's nothing left behind. And again, when I say nothing left behind, as I used the illustration about Brian, uh, the young man that was a little slow and had that empty egg, and he said it was just, the tomb was full of emptiness uh, because of what Jesus has done for us, taking away our sins and the penalty of our sins. And so very, very exciting when we talk about the empty tomb and uh, what a blessing it is that we have a Savior that is risen and that he's not still in the grave somewhere, uh, but he's far beyond that. So look in Acts chapter 13, verse 33 is where we want to start reading. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And so again, we find the fulfilling of the scriptures taking place right here concerning the, uh, if you want to refer to as the rapture, the resurrection of Jesus, and raised him up from the dead. Now, no more to return to corruption. He said, on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore, he saith also in another psalm, thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses." And so again, as we look here, the first thing that pops in my mind when I think of that empty grave is simply it's a fulfillment of the scriptures. And in an interest, it goes all the way back to the Psalms and uh, the Bible quotes the Bible. And that's one way that we can know beyond a shadow of doubt that it is God's word and that it is inspired. And that folks, you ready? We're not limited to just portions of the New Testament. We got the whole Bible, <laughs> you know? And why do people want to limit themselves to just a little tiny portion of the scriptures when it was all written to all of us? And folks, it's so fantastic. When you look in, of course, Psalms 23, what a blessing. A psalm that is, is it refers to Jesus as our savior, as our shepherd. But then you look in 22 and you see how Jesus is gonna suffer on the cross. And it's just such a vivid picture. Isaiah chapter 53, you see the crucifixion and everything taking place there. I want to say the Bible is one big book. Not only that, it's a book that we can always trust in. And as we look at the 66 books that were given to us, and those Psalm 16, verse 10 says this, again, tying to what we just read here in Acts chapter 13, verses 33 through 39. It says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. You might notice that the holy one is capitalized because it's referring to deity, referring to Jesus Christ himself. And so again, what an exciting love when we realize that he didn't see corruption. Folks, he didn't rot, if you please, in the grave, uh, for lack of a better description, but we find that God kept him from that. And again, I'm so thankful that we have a Savior that lives today. Notice in Acts, again, chapter 13, we just looked at it, but God had fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and and here as we're looking at, of course, the book of Acts was the church. It was the actions or the acts of the church at that time, what was going on. Many of the people were Jewish. And so as they pin this here, it says this fulfills the same thing to their children. We find that the scriptures are being fulfilled 
uh, for the Jewish people as well as, if you please, for us too. But in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second Psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So God makes it very, very clear that Jesus is his son. It makes it very, very clear in the scriptures here that Jesus is our God and our Savior. Notice something else that we think of the empty grave. It means salvation to all who believe. I'm glad it's not limited. You know, and how many times have I emphasized that? You know, that even John the Baptist, when Jesus came to be baptized, uh, when he appeared, he just said, said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. I mean, the whole world, not just part of the world. Again, not just one particular sect, if you please, but the whole world. I love what it says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved, for with the heart man believeth unto salvation. And, and again, folks, how exciting it is when we look at what Jesus Christ has done for us. He's, he's done something so marvelous because in ourselves, we're unrighteous. But when Jesus comes in, his righteousness changes us and we become like Jesus. Wow, and, and don't misunderstand me, please. But we're to become like Jesus and all the things that he experienced, all the things that he enjoyed, we will also enjoy. And folks, we'll be perfect. And, and you ready? Let me ask y'all, don't raise any hands. Have any of you had any temptations today? Okay. Have any of you had a, a, a time where you just suddenly felt yourself getting mad, getting upset? Okay. And, and we, we've all had things happen today that we were embarrassed about and things that we wished to hadn't happened. And if I were to ask your family, uh, how did your daddy do today? Or how did your mommy do? Or how did your daughter do? You know, and, and we'd say, well, <laughs> you know, all these different things. And, and Rose could tell us all sorts of things about Chuck, right? Of course, Chuck would never tell us anything about Rose. But anyhow, what I'm trying to say is that we've, we've all fallen to temptations. We'll never be tempted again. Temptation won't have any control over us whatsoever. Can you imagine that? Won't that be glorious? We'll never have a bad thought. Wow. And we could just go on and on. All the wonderful things. You, you ready? Because we'll be like Jesus. <laughs> that, that's perfection, being like Jesus. We'll all have the same mind that which, which is in Christ Jesus will also be in us. So what a tremendous hope we have. So it means, the empty tomb simply means salvation to all who believe. Isn't that great? And folks, that's telling me in essence that if Hitler were to confess his sins and met it with his heart, he could have been saved. Mussolini could have been saved. Gaddafi could have been saved. I could go on down the list. All the people that could have been saved if they had simply confessed that they were sinners and asked Jesus Christ to forgive them of their sin and to come into their heart. God can save anybody. And he has. He saved so many people from so many different walks of life. It's amazing. And then something else that it means. It means justification to all who believe. And again, one way to look at it being justified is just as if I never sinned. I mean, uh, it, it's staggering to even think about that at all. But what I'm trying to say is that's what God says in his word in Romans chapter 4, verse 24. And also, of course, we read in Acts chapter 13 uh, about being justified. But notice what it says, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now folks, think about it, isn't that exciting? When you look at that verse, what it says, in other words, Jesus imputed, he implanted himself upon us. And so when God looks at me, he sees his son. He sees his son covering my sins. And so the word imputed, that's what's referring to, that he has placed his goodness over us. And then as we read on that verse again, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our, our Lord from the dead. And folks, we know that God raised his son. There's no question about it. They had complete trust in each other. We look at Jesus as the flesh of God. We look at God the Father as the soul of God. We look at God the Holy Spirit as, of all things, that's the Spirit. We look at ourselves and we see our physical being, 
But yet at the same time, we realize there's a part of us that will continue on throughout eternity, either in heaven or in hell, depending on what we've done with Christ. And then also we know that we have that part that we refer to as our spirit. And so all those things, it's exciting because God said, let us make man in our images in Genesis chapter 2. And so what I'm saying again, it's exciting when we look at the Trinity of God, we look at the Trinity of man, and we see how that Jesus came and he took our offenses upon himself. He who knew no sin became the sin of the whole world, all of the sin. Wow, every wicked, terrible things you've ever done, but also anything that anyone else has done, he took it all upon himself. And it's sad that so many people refuse to accept God's plan. And how many people think, well, I'll live a good enough life. I'll give enough money to the church that they'll have to take me. I'll, you know, and they think of all these things that they can do. Folks, there's two types of salvation. One is you got to do and do and do and do and do. And hope that when the end of your life comes that you'll have enough good that's going to wait like this. And they'll say, see, God, you got to let me in. But folks, our religion is it's been done. By Jesus Christ. It's done. And, and that's what it's got to be, folks. Is how dare us think that we can outdo God, that we got a better plan than God's got? Shame on us, especially when God paid so much for us to have salvation. So that empty tomb again, what a glorious thing it is when we think of that empty tomb. And again, when I think of that, that ledger that we referred to a moment ago, that balance. I'm so glad that my balance is, <laughs> it is empty because Jesus has taken care of me. Wow. I'm going to heaven because of Jesus, not because of me, not because I'm Baptist or because I'm American or whatever. I'm going to heaven because of Jesus. It means also sanctification. We read it just a moment ago. Romans 6, 4. It says this. It says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, those of you that have experienced uh, baptism service here, uh, those of you that have baptized here, and of course you'll know, uh, what was it, three weeks ago that we were in Texas and I baptized uh, my adopted sister. Uh, she's my cousin by flesh and her husband. And uh, of all things, we did it in the name of Antioch Baptist Church. Of course, it was in the name of the Lord. And as we went through it, I explained all this to him. But simply, you know, this is Jesus. He lived, and then he died and was buried. But on the third day, he rose again. And so I'm so thankful for that picture. But also it pictures the old us before we got saved. And we died to ourselves, and we were buried to ourselves, if you please, and brought up new in Christ Jesus. And so it's a beautiful picture. That's the reason they use the word baptism here. The word baptism, again, it's been alliterated into our language. And that means it's not really English. It's actually uh, what we refer to as Greek. And as we look at it in the Greek, simply if it was to be uh, translated, it would be translated immersion. So John the Baptist was John the Immerser. How about that? Okay. And it's like, uh, like in Spanish, we use the word casa. And I think everybody here knows, well, that means house. That means home. I mean, we don't make a whole lot about it, you know. Uh, pliers, by the way. Did you know that pliers, you know, the tool pliers? That's a French word. And yet we don't make anything about it. We use them all the time. I'm like, you're French. I can't use you. <laughs> we just go ahead and we use it. So what I'm saying is baptism, again, it comes from the Greek word baptizo. And you can see the similarities very much so. So again, it said that we're immersed in the, the death of Jesus and brought up in that new glorified body. And again, something that we can look forward to. It was raised again for our justification. Our justification comes through what Jesus did, not what we did. And again, we have to accept that free gift or it'll do us no good at all. We can know about it, but just knowing is not enough. We have to accept it before we can enjoy it. You know, you can know that you got a cure for whatever. I won't even dare use the word COVID, but you can know that you got a cure for it. And you can know that it really works and it's guaranteed and money back and all sorts of other things with it. But it's not going to do you any good until you use it. Amen. You can know how good it is, but it's not going to help you. And you can know how good Jesus is and how wonderful Jesus is, but until you use him, until you accept him, it's not going to do you any good. 
And then it means something else when I think of the empty tomb. It means sanctification. And I know that's a big sounding word, but it means sanctification to all who believe. And therefore, said, uh, I'm sorry, I'll quote the verse before I tell you what verse is. Romans 6, 4, it says it this way. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Okay, see the similarities. And then it goes on and says that like as Jesus, uh, as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even we so also walk in newness of life. And so again, how exciting it is to see that when we accepted Christ, then we were separated from the world. We were separated from sin. We were separated from the penalties that comes. And God has separated us so that we can do a great work for him through that sanctification. Through that sanctification, that means that his spirit has control of us. It is sad that so many Christians have accepted Christ. And when they accepted Christ, they accepted the Holy Spirit. They accepted the Father. They accepted all that at the same time. But how sad it is that so many times we put the Holy Spirit off in a corner in our heart and we don't let him take control like he wants to. And folks, we're the ones that lose out. It's not God losing out, it's us that are losing out when we fail to yield to him. So again, that sanctification is so important. Then notice something else in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. It says, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. And simply, we see the assurance to all who believe. We can know that when we accept Christ, we accept eternal life. You can't separate the two, and I'm so glad you came. When I received the gift of Jesus, he brought with me eternal life. And for me to lose eternal life would mean that God lied to me. Because if he gave me eternal life and I lost it, it wasn't eternal, was it? It was temporary. Yeah. It was contingent upon something I did or didn't do or whatever. But we see it's a wonderful gift that says in, in Romans 6, 23, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What a fantastic gift. And again, folks, that doesn't give us a license to sin and go, oh man, I'm going to heaven, so I can just go ahead and do what I want to do. I'm going to heaven. God forbid. Folks, when I got saved, my heart got changed. And the things that I used to do, I didn't want to do them anymore. I wanted to distance myself from them. Again, that's where that word sanctification comes in. I wanted to separate from those things and do what God wanted me to do. I wanted to do what was right. And I trust that you feel the same way too. And so I see the assurance that comes to all who believe. Folks, again, there's no one in here that could raise your hands and I deserve heaven because I am so wonderful. <laughs> uh, that's not even funny, is it, folks? And how sad that somebody would think that they have done it. But that's what you're saying. When you do it your own way, when you're doing it in your own strength, when you say, man, I've done all this work, God's got to let me into heaven. I've done this, I did that, and I've given all. Folks, it doesn't work that way. And then here's something else I like. Maybe this is the best part of the whole empty tomb. And there's some unusual wording in it. But notice what it says. It means fruitfulness to all who believe. And folks, every one of us should have a desire to be fruitful. I remember my, my mother-in-law. Of course, most of you knew my mother-in-law, uh, Mamaw Cook. She went to be with the Lord. She was 99 years old, wasn't she, Mama? And so she would, oh, she was two months from 99, I think it was. And she just loved the Lord with all of her heart. And her husband was a pastor, and she had a number of children and in laws and so forth that were pastors. But somebody asked her one day, he said, Mrs. Cook, do you have any regrets in life? And she just almost immediately answered, said, Yes, I do. And they said, Well, Mrs. Cook, what do you regret? She said, well, I wish I'd had more children. She only had nine. <laughs> what I'm saying, she wanted to be fruitful. You know what I'm saying? And, and as a Christian, shouldn't we want to be fruitful, folks? Shouldn't we want to have spiritual folks? And, and I appreciate that, Dave, because he used the term James, my, my running buddy or whatever, somebody that, that they were going out and doing things together, trying to bring people to Christ. 
And folks, that should be true of all of us. We should have those that we spend time with trying to bring others to Jesus too. And, and as we get out in this world, we're going to see our friends need to know Jesus. When we get out in this world, we're going to find that our enemies need Jesus too. And we can go on down the list, everyone that needs Jesus. But God wants to help us when people have a need for Jesus. He wants to help us to reach them before it's eternally too late. And it's amazing what God can do. But that verse, again, it's so unusual, the word in Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. And so again, it's referring to us dying. Paul put it this way. He said, I die daily. In other words, daily, he, he put himself to death. In Galatians, he said, nevertheless, yet not I live, but Christ liveth through me. As he was talking about being crucified on a daily basis. And folks, what I'm saying is that we need to willingly say, Lord, uh, not my will today, but your will be done. Lord, please use me today. And, and Lord, help me not to try to take control of things. Let me let you work through me. Then he goes on and says that ye should be married to another. And what's that referring to? It's referring to the unique relationship that we have to Jesus. Jesus considers the church his bride. And so as he considers the church his bride, we make up that bride. And, and again, that's a unique relationship. It's, it's something that you choose each other in that relationship. And so again, the Lord Jesus Christ looks at us as his church and that we need to choose to follow him because we love him above all of us and we forsake everyone else to follow after him. There's an even so, or even to him who is raised from the dead. And folks, in it need that the day is coming, that those of us that are believers, the day is coming that we'll be raised up from the dead. And I, I don't know when the rapture takes place, and I believe it could be anytime soon. I believe that there's going to be such a transformation. This old flesh is going to die in one sense and be brought up immediately new. It's going to be an instantaneous thing. It's going to happen in the twinkle of an eye. I mean, we're just going to, wow, look at you. Wow, look at me. Wow, what happened? Wow, I see Jesus everywhere. You know, <laughs> and it's going to be such a fantastic thing. No more pain. Wow. No more suffering how different things are going to be. And then he goes on that unique relationship with him, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. In other words, because we belong to Jesus, it should only be natural that we want to bring others to Jesus. Uh, in amazing people can be so proud of their uh, grandkids and say, hey, let me show you a picture of my grandkid, you know? And, uh, you know, I got to show you what's happening here. Let me show you a picture of my kids or whatever. And then I get these crazy people going, let me show you a picture of my grandpuppy. So uh, I'm not picking on you, uh, on the job, okay? <laughs> but, but, yeah. but what I'm saying is that some people, you know, they, they, they got all these other things that they love too. But anyhow, what I'm trying to say, folks, is that it's so very, very important that we do the work for God. It says in John 15, 5, and this is what shows where we're at as we finish up our message tonight. Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. And folks, Jesus refers to the vine. He's basically referring to what we might call today the trunk of that tree. And from that trunk, the branches shoot out. And... <laughs> And again, don't take this the wrong way, but what happens is that tree has sap that flows through it. And it gets the nutrients from the ground and the roots spread it through. And finally, at certain times of the year, you're going to produce some fruit. There's going to be apples on that apple tree. There's going to be peaches on a peach tree. And there's going to be nuts on that nut tree. And I don't know. I identify more with the nut tree. But, but anyhow, but what I'm saying is it's fantastic if we abide in Jesus. But if you take one of those branches off, it's not going to bear any fruit. It's still a branch, but it's not going to bear any fruit. And what's sad is many Christians have pulled themselves off the trunk. But isn't it nice that you can be engrafted back in? But they've, they've been, if you please, for whatever reasons, they've fallen off. And God says he wants us to remain with him. Because he said this, The same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. And so with the blood of Jesus flowing, if you please, in us and through us, we can reach out and bring others to salvation. And it's so important that we do what we can to make a difference in this world. Folks, this world needs Jesus. 
You ready? This world needs you and I doing what we're supposed to do, following Jesus. And if we follow Jesus, according to what Jesus says, can we trust him? Folks, he's not a politician, okay? <laughs> we can trust him. We can trust him. We can believe him. And if we do, then we can look forward to receiving fruit. And you know what? I've never, ever regretted, you know, and you can ask my wife. I've never said, oh, I, I hate it so much that Roy Dale got saved. Wasn't that terrible, Mom? And now he's a preacher and doing all these things. And now he's got kids serving on the mission field. And Isn't that just terrible? Isn't that awful? I, what I'm saying is something that you get excited about when you see people get saved and you see their lives change as they become new and become at one with Jesus, as you become at one with Jesus, you can have a unity through Christ that you can't have in anything else. The empty tomb, maybe this is the crudest way to put it, but it's the exclamation mark to the resurrection, Amen. okay? The fact that it's empty, it's proof, if you please, that Jesus did not stay in the grave. And folks, too many Christians we act more dead than alive. Amen. And that's a tragedy because we have a very lively news. We have something to be excited about. We have something that can, well, we have something that the world needs. And I don't care what the world tries, they're always going to come up short. They may find something that they can tinker with for a little bit and it might bring a little bit of joy, a little bit of excitement or whatever, but it won't last. But what we do for Christ, are you ready? Not only will it last in this world, if you please, but it lasts for all eternity. Isn't that fantastic? I mean, isn't it exciting what we can do in our relationship with Christ? I am so thankful that we have an empty tomb, that we have a resurrected Savior. And folks, we need to get excited and share the good news that Jesus saves, no matter where somebody might be. I dealt with a man today and he just said, Pastor, I slipped. I messed up. And he said, I, I know exactly what I need to do. I want to get back with Jesus. And I didn't argue with him. I said something like, uh, you're preaching to the choir here. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but how true that is, folks. Yeah. Jesus has exactly what we need. So would you stand to your feet as we begin our invitation? Lord, thank you for this time that we can share your word with the folks that are here. And help us when we think of um, the empty tomb. <laughs> help us to be reminded of all the wonderful things that come and the testimony of that empty tomb. And how that is a testimony to us and that it should be a challenge to encourage us to do more for you than we've ever done before. Help, you to, help us to see that we have a new life in you. And what a tragedy that many times we go back to the old flesh. We go back to the world. We go back to the things of the devil instead of back to you. Lord, forgive us. And if we're just standing still, we're really doing nothing for you. We're just spinning our wheels. Help us to go forward for the cause of Christ. Help us to realize that people really are dying and going to hell. But at the same time, help us to realize that people really are dying and going to heaven because they got you. Help us to make a difference in this wicked world. Lord, help us to spend our last days, and we feel like it's short, but help us spend the last days pointing people to you. For we ask this in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. So, folks, God bless you. And uh, I hope when you make that empty tomb, it'll fill you up with something get you excited. Okay? Amen.